wisdom. You know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance even in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthy we dare not and our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the last time. A reading from Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, 
not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed for us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we will wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Master! 
Now, some of us have maybe had that experience, particularly those of us who are not very good gardeners. Uh, when you go out and you start weeding the flower patch and you start pulling things up, I've been scolded from time to time, back from the time I was a kid, unto the present day, that off the time, more often than not, I'm pulling up the flowers rather than the weeds. And if you have a patch of wildflowers, I can't tell the difference. And so there it is that we have already in our experience that same kind of experience, that same kind of image that Jesus is using, that things look alike, and if we go in and we try to root them out, right, you know, at, at the get-go, we might make some very serious mistakes along the way. And the problem with the beard Darnell is also that it looks very much just, they're not, just not similar, they look almost identical, until the seed gets ripe, and then you can tell the difference. But what Jesus also hasn't actually explained in his, in his parable, but everybody else would know, would be that they, these two plants grow very differently. A stalk of wheat has a root system that goes down into the ground, where the bearded darnel has one of those root systems that sort of goes out. And so as it grows, it wraps itself around the root system of the wheat. So if you went to pull out the weed, the weed stalk would come right with it. It's not so easy, for example, as getting rid of the dandelions in your lawn. You can tell the great difference between the two of them. Or perhaps uh, crabgrass or something like that, with which we might be a bit more familiar. It's very different than the uh, Kentucky bluegrass that we want to plant in, in our uh, or fescue or whatever of those things. I need help here. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. It's very different. It looks very different, right, Sarah? You can right. tell the difference, does it? Very Darnell and we can't. And because they grow very differently in terms of their root systems, it's dangerous to try to pull up the weeds before it's ready for the harvest. So Jesus says in the parable of the master of the garden is saying, let it grow, let them grow together. In the end, We'll sort it out. In the end, we'll sort it out. And that's what I'd like you to, to, to focus on just a little bit. You see, because in the church, even at the very beginning of the church, these early disciples reading this Gospel of Matthew, having it proclaimed in their midst, they were having struggles. They were having struggles with people who fell away from faith in Christ. They were having struggles with people who would turn in fellow disciples to uh, synagogue authorities or perhaps even later on during the Roman persecutions to Roman authority. So they had people that were in the mind of the early church rather dangerous. They were weeds among the, uh, among the wheat. And so the urge of the human nature is that to get rid of those weeds, get rid of them, cut them off, get them out before they cause much more trouble. The fact is we don't often know really what the difference is between a weed and a wheat. We might think we do, but often we make a mistake. Think of this. During the last uh, several decades, we've become very sensitive to our dietary <coughs> intake. Uh, those of us who have been trying to watch cholesterol and all that sort of thing, for a while we were told no butter, no eggs, etc. Well, more recent wisdom says you need the other proteins and nutrients in the egg, and after all, the yolk isn't all that bad for you to start with, so eat eggs. And now, you know, we, we, we did away with butter almost entirely. We started eating margarine, and we made the margarines taste more and more like butter. Uh, for, in fact, one of the brands is something like tastes just like butter or something. You can't, I can't believe it's not butter, that's it. You know, so you got all that going on. Well, now we're told that the margarines are bad for you. You really should go back to the natural foods, which are, it's the butter. Just don't eat a lot of it. Studies even show how people who do a lot of French cooking with lots of butter, just like Julia Child used to do, actually are fairly healthy heart products. Well, probably because they also added a little red wine to their diet, you know. But, you know, those are the kinds of things. So, you know, what is today's wisdom is tomorrow's problem. Maybe it's like that in the church, too. <clears throat> that from time to time we can get so caught up in trying to see things in our penchant for wanting things black and white, 
clear, good, evil, that we go about the business of trying to root out sin and root out evil when in fact we might be doing something contrary to the will of God. And that, after all, is the very source of evil and sin, doing things that are contrary to the will of God. How we discern and learn the will of God becomes critically important. Part of that teaches us really that life is not full of black and white, those clear markers of good and evil. Most of life is very gray. There's a certain amount of ambiguity in our lives that we don't like living with, but in fact may even be holy. It may not be something that we simply want to get rid of, but rather is something that is good for us. To be able to help us to begin to discern good from evil and figure it all out, so that in the end, we are bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. So what if there's a weed next to me? Who cares? In the end, God will sort it all out. That's part of what Jesus is trying to get at. We might be so busy trying to make ourselves pure that we forget that that's not our job. That our job is simply to be good seed, to take the kingdom of God, to take the gospel of Christ, and to sow it in the world in such a way that other people come closer to God and begin to understand the great love and grace shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. That that's our job. It's not our job to judge as to whether someone is good or evil, whether they are the wheat or the tear. It is that for us that we are good enough to take care of ourselves. And that in God's good grace that we will grow and bear fruit for the kingdom. That's what God gives us to do. The rest of it is up to Him. God is the one who will sort it out in the end. Well, does that mean we sort of take an attitude? Eh, whatever. Not really, no. Because it is about making ourselves in tune with the mind of Christ. It is about making ourselves part and parcel of the values of the kingdom of God. It is about ourselves, by God's grace, becoming true fruit-bearing wheat. And not turning into one of the weeds. That's what this parable is about. Ultimately, it's about the fact that God is the one who will make it all right in the end. It's not our job. Our job is simply to be planted and to grow and produce as much fruit, as much seed as we can possibly produce. That's where our energy needs to go, not worrying about the weed next to us. God will take care of us. That relieves us of a lot of anxiety and a lot of responsibility. If we're not responsible for the purity of the church, if we're not responsible for sorting out good from evil, black from white, and every constant little thing that we talk about, then we can get about the business of focusing our attention with laser-like precision on the life of Christ and the path that he sets out for us, and we can follow it up. We don't need to worry and spend all that energy ripping up the weeds. Because it's in the end that the harvest will come through. And the fruit that's born will make the difference whether you are burned in the fire or gathered into the barn. Think of it that way, then really what we should spend our energy doing is bearing good fruit. Fruit that is the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit that is joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. Fruit that is wisdom, counsel, courage, fortitude, the kinds of things that are born of the Spirit. If we cultivate those things in our minds and in our hearts, 
We need not worry whether we'll be gathered into the barn or into the fire. The judgment of God will take care of that all by itself. So the question becomes, what fruit are you, are you going to bear as you come to full maturity? As the grains of wheat are formed toward the end of the life of that wheat stalk, will it produce the kind of grain that is useful for the kingdom of God? That's the question we need to look at. That's what Jesus, I think, is trying to get us to understand. That it isn't about the weeds, it's about us. And that we become the wheat and bear much fruit. If we do that, we need not worry about the harvest. That's the worry, the job of the harvest master. And in the end, God will make it worse. And so my brothers and sisters, stand with me to profess our faith in ancient words we say, we believe in the Lord God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of the heaven and earth, of all that is seen and are not seen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of God.
John, Sandy, Grace, Marion, Rosemary, Robert, Barbara, Thomas, Fred, Betty Jane, Eleanor, and Cindy. You have made us for a noble purpose, to love and care for each other at every turn. Give us the compassion and skill we need to love our neighbor and seek wholeness for all in need. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray for your creation, for scientists and conservation officials and others entrusted with care for your creation in nature, your faithfulness in the earth itself. Rid us of the apathy and greed that injures its health, for you have bound your creation together for the blessing of all. Lord, have mercy. Let us remember those who have died. You call us into communion and worship to glorify you and sing your praise. Make us one with the saints who have found their eternal rest in you. Lord, have mercy. You open your mouth and honor the word, and creation sprang forth in abundance. Let us open our mouths and praise, that we may bear fruit in every season, and be satisfied by your goodness. For you, O God, are the source of all growth. Your grace abounds forever. Amen. Amen. So we pray for our diocese and for those involved in the search for our new bishop. You constantly love us, Lord, to venture to which we cannot see the ending. By paths as yet untrodden, through perils yet unknown. Open our eyes that we might see your word in the world around us. Open our ears that we might hear your voice as it calls us forward. Open our hearts that we might experience your living and being love.
For you are the source of light and all life. You made us in your own image, and you have called us to a new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so now we come together to praise you, joining our voices with those of angels and archangels, and indeed the whole company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
These are the gifts of God that are now given for the people of God. Take them in remembrance of Christ dying for you. Feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Thank you, God.